What's up guys? Connor and I are in a uh, little bit of a different uniform than we usually are. We're in our tactical protective gear at an active threat training at the New Highlands Ranch Hospital. So UC Health, which owns the hospital, is just getting it in service. It's going to be open to the public soon. Uh, but before that happens, they wanted to do a training with their own personnel and with the sheriff's office and fire rescue so that if an active threat happened and that there was a shooter and someone hurt, that their staff would know how to react. And then that gave our personnel and us a great opportunity to train. Absolutely. And uh, even during the training, this is our PIO tactical worksheet, and we're able to put important information on here, uh, anything from the amount of victims that are injured um, to the critical factors of the incident, media staging area, um, the, the incident command name, as well as where it's occurring. So that way, when these details are coming out and as the situation is progressing, we can go through, and this is actually a dry erase board, so we can write things down and then be able to erase them as things are changing in order to give uh, the most clear picture to the media as well as the community of exactly what's happening. So it was great to use this today to practice. Yeah. And for those of you who are familiar with ballistic helmets, you'll see that we're wearing our chin straps like fire helmets instead of like these police or in uh, military helmets because uh, it's a little bit more comfortable. I don't know how you law enforcement <laughs> folks can do this. It, yeah, uh, I, I could deal it with this annoying. a little bit, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like it just rests kind of awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we went inside with the engine and medic crews to see what they were doing and how they were treating the situation. So take a look. You got two and two? Ready? Yeah, you guys are gonna go. Just your only wound right here? Okay, so. Okay. You allergic to anything? Oh, I'm going. Okay. So you can kick his back. Nothing. Nothing. Clear. Cool. Alrighty. Two. Three. Two. Hey guys, we're coming at you today from the driving pad at our training facility because we're featuring my pickup truck on a Fleet Friday today as part of this vlog. And because the training recruits are cutting roofs right now and Connor's gonna go over there and you get to see that in uh, the upcoming Fire Academy week three. Is it week three? Yeah, yeah. it is week three. Week Ventilation three. training is what they're doing today. Awesome. All right guys, Fleet Friday. So we know you wanna see more fleet and we know that you want to see the PIO car because you've been saying that in the comments. So we're going to take you through my pickup truck. It's a 2015 Ford F-150 that's assigned to me as my primary vehicle. And it's a take home vehicle for me because as PIOs, we have to respond at all hours of the night. Originally, this vehicle was assigned to METCOM, our 911 dispatch center, and it was used for the incident dispatch team that responds to major incidents. So it's set up a lot like a battalion chief vehicle. All right, let's take a look. So inside where I sit at the driver's seat, I've got access to three different radios. We've got two primary radios that we use that are seven, 800 megahertz, and they're on our state digital trunk radio system. That's what South Metro operates on on a normal basis. There's also a VHF radio in there, which we need for interoperability with aircraft, for wildland fires, and interoperability with our partnering agencies that surround us. Some of them, especially the ones that are up in the foothills and in the mountains, are only on VHF, so we need interoperability there. Probably one of the most important pieces of technology that we have in the vehicle is the MDC or the uh, mobile data computer. So this is showing us where active calls are located and if we get a call and need to respond, we can read the notes of that incident. And most importantly, we've got an awesome map. So as I zoom in on the map to this area in Parker, close to where we're located at, we can see where all of the fire hydrants are. They're the red dots, and you can see the property lines. And as we zoom in even further, you can see all of the individual street addresses. So our responders know exactly where they need to go. One of the other things that I have in my truck is a dash cam, and you guys get to see video of that pretty often. So it's uh, staring at Connor, staring back at us. Uh, so since this vehicle was the incident dispatch team and they used it for dispatching operations and needed headsets, it is set up very similar to how our battalion chief vehicles are and it has a David Clark headset system on board. 
So there's three different writing positions in here. They actually have their own headsets. I have a one-eared headset that sits on the back of my chair. And then I could wear this on the way to calls if I want. Um, it's a really great way to hear everything that's going on uninterrupted. Where When we're going to calls, there's a lot of different activity going on. Multiple radio channels are in use. Sometimes we're getting phone calls. Um, there's just a lot of noise. And so being able to focus on something really important if we need to do that is really nice if we're in a loud environment and we just need to focus on what's going on. Um, the other really nice thing is from a major incident standpoint, the controls are individual for each headset. So that means that if Connor is sitting in the driver's seat or the passenger seat, she can put on a different headset and turn up one of the two radios in her ear and I can be listening to something completely different. Um, especially on some of our 4th of July's, on our red flag warning days, we may have more than one major incident occurring and it's really beneficial for one of us to be able to focus on that incident and not have to worry about anything else. So it gives us a really great office opportunity in here. It's, it's like operating in the peace and quiet and being able to hear everything that's going on. We can also use the controls to transmit on the radio if we need to as well. Um, so it's a really nice piece of technology that benefits us. So each control box is able to control the volume of Radio 1 and Radio 2, and then we can transmit on either Radio 1 or Radio 2 by pressing down the button, and then that's the overall headset volume in general. Um, but if I want to just listen to an incident on Radio 1, I can come over here to 2 and turn that volume completely down, and now I won't hear what's going on on that radio. So the bottom right button is labeled Opticom. That's a special light that is designed to change traffic signals green in the direction that emergency vehicles are responding. The next one is a puddle light, and the puddle lights are on the front and on both sides of the truck. And when that button gets activated, it essentially turns on little porch lights around the truck so that people can see it better. The right and left alley lights are for the spotlights. Um, so they can be operated independently on the right side or the left side, or they can both be on. The takedown lights are the spotlights that are on the grill and in the light bar. So if I hit that, then it projects really bright light forward. Low power mode is really nice. These LED lights are super bright. And sometimes when we get on scene, they're way too bright if it's nighttime. So I can hit the low power button and it cuts their light intensity down by about 50%. So it's still visible to people so that they don't hit the vehicle and they can see it, but it's also not blinding to everybody around us. The other light controls are flash, and that does a random flash pattern on the back of my light bars, um, both of them, the main red and blue one and the amber one on the pickup truck topper. And you can actually see on here what the lights are doing on the back when I activate that. Um, outside of flash, and, and it can do different patterns, the really important one is directional arrows. So this one is scrolling to tell traffic to go to the left, and if I hit it again, it'll tell traffic to go to the right, and if I hit it another time, it'll tell traffic to split. Um, so if we were in a three-lane road and there was a hazard in the middle lane and I was trying to block the hazard for safety, this is advising drivers to take the lanes around me and go around. Um, so the light controls are really nice and it's great to be able to see what they're doing on my control board um, to make it a little bit more clear. The other buttons that are on here are related to sound and related to sirens. And I actually have two different kinds of sirens on this truck. I have a power call siren box and I have the Wayland siren box. So I can actually control um, both sirens. They can both be on at the same time and projecting through the front. Um, so starting up at the top is the air horn. Then there's the manual um, cue siren button, so it's the electronic version of what a, a federal cue siren sounds like. And if I hold that down with my finger, then it'll just ramp up all the way like, like what you can hear a mechanical siren doing. When I take my finger off, it'll ramp back down. Then there's the more traditional um, phaser, yelp, and whale signs, it, sounds that you hear on most emergency vehicles. And then down below are the ever popular power call sirens, and they're definitely my favorite. Um, one of the cool things about having both of the siren boxes and siren speakers separate is that, that they can run at the same time. So for instance, there you go. All right, 
I move into the back seat on the driver's side, this is where I keep my personal protective equipment for structural calls, which is what uh, Connor and I wear most of the time. Uh, I keep my laptop bag in here so that um, I've always got something with me where we can draft things up on the computer if we need to, edit photos, edit video, whatever we might need to do. Um, so personal protective equipment there and then camera bag on the other side. So the, uh, the Sony Alphas that I carry to take still photos and take, take higher quality video than what our iPhones are capable of, I've got those in the bag ready to go. Moving to the side compartment, this is set up a lot like our battalion chief trucks as far as how the compartment is open so that you can keep equipment inside. It's got an LED light strip that automatically turns on when the door is open. And this is where I keep the personal protective equipment that I don't wear as often. Um, so we've got tactical helmet and tactical vests that are assigned to us um, for ballistic protection. And that's for active shooter calls or, or any kind of a threat to us from weapons. There are times where as PIOs we're responding to those events and sometimes where we'll be operating in the warm zone, meaning it could still be a dangerous place. So we have these to keep us safe. Also have a PFD, a personal flotation device or a life vest. Uh, the PIOs carry these as well because we do respond all hazards to a lot of different water emergencies in the district. And policy says if we're anywhere near the water within 10 or 15 feet, we need to be wearing this. There's also the opportunity for the PIOs to go out on South Metro's boats. So we have to be able to be safe while we're out on the boats. Behind this is where I keep my Wildland gear. So Wildland helmet, Wildland shirt and pants already set up in my Wildland boots and then my web gear, which includes the most important thing, which is a fire shelter. So sometimes I'm actually using this quite a lot. Um, we're in the spring green up right now, so we've had a few brush fires lately, like the one you'll see in this episode, uh, but we're not in the primary wildland realm yet, so this isn't getting used a ton until things dry out. Most of what I use most of the time is the structural gear, and that's why it's in the cab with me. Coming around to the back of the truck. My truck is equipped with a slide out tray and it'll actually come out a little bit further. The nice thing with this is we can carry a lot of different stuff, uh, bulky things that are heavy and it's really easy for us to move it around. Whereas with the SUVs, there's just not as much space for us. Um, so in, in this huge rolling bin is where we keep extra camera equipment like uh, lighting for video work, tripods, any kind of set material that we might need. It can stay out of the weather here. There's also a big Pelican case behind it. That Pelican case is weather sealed and it also carries additional camera equipment for us. So we've really got two options. We could keep it all in an office or locked up somewhere and have to go get it and then take it where we need to, or it could just be in one place, which makes it a lot easier, especially when our district is nearly 300 square miles. It's nice to have it with us all the time when we need it. Um, this is a decon bucket, which is similar to what our fire engines and, and aerials carry and inside is just cleaning material so that when our firefighters are exposed to uh, soot and all the nasty stuff on fires they can clean themselves off. It's not a huge need for PIOs to have it but it's a new thing for us. Um, so this one was duplicated so that we could show our media partners when we're on scene exactly what's in the bucket and how it's used. Um, really it's a prop more than anything but it has the equipment in it so if we need more decon material, either for ourselves or for the firefighters on scene, I've got that with me. Ever important fire extinguisher, which all of our staff vehicles carry. And then I've just got a couple of extra hand tools, a snow shovel because uh, PIO work and, and rescue work doesn't stop when there's a lot of snow on the ground and we can find ourselves in deep snow where we either have to dig our vehicle out or maybe carve a path for some reason. And then I carry a McLeod with me as well. Uh, it's a wildland tool. So that way when I'm operating or when PIOs in general are operating independently on wildland scenes, we've got a method to dig out a spot to use our fire shelter if we ever had to do that. That's an important component. Um, tucked away in here is actually another car battery. So there's a car battery in the engine compartment and one that sits back here. And this is the one that powers all the accessories, especially the MDC, the computer in the front of the vehicle and it is wired to a solar panel, which is that flat gray rectangular shape 
that's on top of the truck. And all day long, it's charging in the sun and keeping that battery charged. And then at night when I get home or if I'm in our parking garage at headquarters, there's actually a shoreline that plugs into the side of the truck to keep that battery charged. This side is extra equipment. There's a battery charger in here for radio batteries. Um, both of the compartments have 110 and 12 volt power with power strips so that we can plug chargers in there to plug our phones if we have to or additional equipment like this small printer. Um, there's a, additional equipment in here that we could use for prolonged incidents, um, some command vests and vests that have good pockets for photography and all the extra stuff we need to carry. Some snacks because sometimes we get stuck out on scene for a long time. And then I carry extra personal protective equipment with me. It's um, not rare at all for us to have media riders or uh, members of the fire department or fire department family members that are on scene with them doing ride-alongs and might need extra identification or equipment wherever we're going. Um, so I just have that ready so that they're safe and, and we can take them into other areas of the call. This side is pretty much left open because a lot of times when we're doing media ride-alongs, we'll have a photographer and a reporter. So we have to have room for three people to be driving and, and riding in the vehicle safely. Um, you'll notice there's what looks like a piece of wood or a cutting board in here. This is similar to what our battalion chiefs use and it actually hangs on the steering wheel and provides a desk for us. This is our accountability board that incident commanders use for uh, running incident scenes and keeping accountability. It's not a need for PIOs, but it's extra. So if for some reason we're, we get a really good parking spot or we have somebody jump in our vehicle and need to use it, they have the ability to do the tracking. It also is good for us to be able to explain to our media partners and use as a prop. And the desk itself is great because we can set it on the steering wheel. I can put my laptop computer on there to do video editing or writing up a press release or anything like that. So it makes our truck kind of like a mobile office space. We had a brush fire along the Cherry Creek Trail, this time north of Broncos Parkway. So Connor was at the training facility doing a little training of her own when that happened. So I responded over. It was about a quarter acre that burned and there were some kids seen running from the area uh, right after the fire started. So our investigators are following up on that. It's the same spot uh, or pretty close to the same spot where you saw the last brush fire that we responded to along the Cherry Creek Trail. So kind of a common thing for us. Um, thankfully, that one was in pretty short grass. Uh, we have the spring green up that's happening right now. So didn't threaten anything and uh, the crews were able to contain it pretty quick. On Saturday, it was the 20th anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting. And now that Littleton Fire Rescue is a part of South Metro, Columbine is a part of our history now. And firefighters were at Clement Park for the big remembrance ceremony that happened Saturday afternoon. Some of them were in attendance in the crowd and just kind of taking everything in. We know that some of our members actually attended Columbine High School. Some of our members responded to the shooting as, as emergency responders. So it hits people pretty hard that week and certainly that day. And uh, really it's, it's just that our firefighters are members of the community that we serve. So uh, we're here for some of the community's best days and we're also here for the community's worst days and we're there to remember with the community when something like this happens so um, I was out at the park and captured some of those moments and, and just listened to what was going on and then of course from an emergency preparedness standpoint we had firefighters and paramedics as well as a lot of law enforcement there in case someone wanted to do harm to everybody who was there remembering um, there was actually a, a manhunt that happened earlier in the week for a person that uh, they were worried about they had closed schools down because this armed person was considered that are dangerous and, and might want to hurt people. That happened a few days earlier, so tensions were just kind of high. Uh, thankfully, the event went just as planned and, and there was nothing bad that happened at all, but we were certainly prepared if, it, if something did happen. So while I was at the brush fire, Connor and our communications director, Kristen, and our communications intern, Brooke, were down at the drill ground and they were doing an observation of live fire inside the burn building. And really that was just to kind of celebrate Brooke's last of the 400 hours she had to do as an intern for her degree. Uh, so what did you guys do? 
Yep, and we miss Brooke because she's getting ready to graduate, but she knows she's, we know she's off to bigger and greater things. Uh, but it was really neat. We got to go right over to the drill ground over here and we were able to put on some SCBAs, get on some bunker gear, uh, go and see some live fire in our burn building for a demonstration and just carry around some of the equipment that firefighters are in charge of. And I gotta say, Eric, it was, we were really tired by the end of the day because uh, just even walking around, it was a hot day outside. So um, definitely a lot of equipment that weighs a lot uh, that needs to be brought around so I can tell you we learned a lot that day and had a lot of fun too. Thanks as always for following along like and share if you uh, enjoyed the video please leave us your comments and questions we love talking with all of you guys and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you always want to get updated I can hear chainsaws screaming away yeah, down at the drill ground so uh, <laughs> I'm guessing the week three recruit video is gonna be awesome we're gonna bring it to you yeah, today or tomorrow. We'll see you guys then. Cool. See ya.